Are you looking for the latest and greatest in power meter tech? Do you have this race next race season that you, you want to get the best? You want to find that little piece of technology that will give you an edge in your training? Eh, me neither. But you can't. And what I mean by you can't is there actually hasn't been any major changes in power meters in the last eh, three, maybe even five years. And it's really interesting to see how the whole industry has evolved. Um, there's been a lot of changes and it's sometimes they're not for the better. And we'll get into that in, in a bit, but I wanted to talk about how I got into this industry years ago and I'm, I'm not really related to the power meter stuff anymore, um, but I sometimes do work consulting about things like sensors and strain gauges. I was examining some load cells for a non-power meter application and looking at the designs it was very easy to come up with something that in theory should work really good and then in application it's it's not quite as good as the theory would say. And then you do things like using simulations you can look into how gauge placement affects these things. And it's it's really interesting to see that because a lot of these designs, because of the sh mechanics involved, because of the, the shape of the structure that these strain gauges are applied to, a little bit of an offset on a gauge, a little bit of an angle, um, the force applied slightly off, like if you have that mounting hole for your your, you know, um, pole mounting fixture, just a little off center. How does that affect things? And I was really, really surprised to see in a lot of cases, it affects things tremendously. On the other side of things, I had been doing some background research and was looking up some, some companies um, from the F, via the FCC filings. So a lot of people don't realize, but whenever a wireless uh, transmitter is used, especially in sports or any other field, it has to be uh, tested for RF and make sure it's under certain limits and certain bands. And all of these things are filed and are publicly available on the FCC website for the US. And uh, a little bit harder, but Industry Canada support uh, supply data and information, but it's really, it's much more painful to get. This is important because you can go in and look at people's circuit board designs. And a trend that I've been seeing recently is a march to cost. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you look at their first generation and compared to a second generation or even a third generation product, sometimes, uh, you know, some of the older stuff, you can see these jumps of, all right, we did this, we changed a supplier for uh, a chip, um, but there's there's no major differences. You know, the analog to digital converters, for instance, is a is kind of the heart of these devices. And I've seen companies change, but I've seen companies now really looking to cheap out, trying to replace some parts with cheaper parts, more um, off-brand Chinese parts getting into these things. Um, just a whole lot of trying to drop the price. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Essentially, it means that there is adoption in the market. There is a mass market for it now. And the consumers are now price sensitive. You're, you're into this um, point where the, the price, a $100 difference, used to not be a big deal. It was more based on reviews and brand loyalty. Now it's more like, that one's $100 cheaper. I'll buy that. So price sensitivity is now important and we can actually kind of map out these changes. So let's kind of get into that and then use that as a launching point to talk about where power meters kind of should have went and where they could still go or maybe where they should go. So let's go over a bit of this history and then maybe we can talk a little bit about where things are going. So. This looks a bit of a mess, so hopefully you can follow with me. Um, the blue feature sets, straight lines dual-sided, or maybe 
somewhere, think of somewhere between here as total power units, the, the spiders and the wheels. Um, Single-sided is a dashed line. Price is in green here. Um, we're gonna start at 3,000 all the way down to about 500. Again, straight line is dual-sided, dashed is single, and this red line is the Kickstarters. Accuracy, uh, solid line in orange here is dual or total power. Single, single-sided is the dashed and this straight kind of pinkish line is Shimano. Um, so back in 2013, power meters were really, really, really high cost. Uh, you know, the cheapest quarks at the time were 1800 um, SRMs, three to four thousand dollars even a, a power tap wheel might have been the cheapest option but you also had to buy a wheel so you know you look at the hub cost but then you have to look at relacing a wheel and a rim or buying it all together and at that time you know shipping costs were much more annoying so in terms of the feature set we're trucking along back in 2013 with a basic feature set and it starts ramping up, I think around 2015, Bluetooth power starts sort of grabbing hold right around when Stages is launching. Um, they were big contributors, I believe, uh, them and Wahoo and a couple of others of the Bluetooth profiles. And Ant Plus adds features. This is around the time that these new uh, torque effectiveness and pedal smoothness metrics come in. People start utilizing the left and right balance. And so you see most power meters are growing to this kind of between what I call feature and advanced level. And all throughout this, you see these, these plateaus, there's nothing really happening, something happened, nothing happening. And now we're, we're starting to see an uptick again. That's kind of interesting. But you'll notice it, it, it still haven't peaked above what I'd call advanced. And what I mean is, even back here, companies were talking about high-speed data. There are companies that actually built infrastructure because they expected that this trend would keep going up. And it never happened. It, it plateaued, and now people are just making up fake features, fake versions of pedal smoothness. They're starting to get into trainers now. It's gotten into um, spider-based power meters. So most of the duels hit their singles. Yeah, you're a little hit or miss. You know, it can vary up and down to practically just a basic power meter or something a little more feature-rich, but a lot of the times those features are, aren't that useful, especially in a single-sided configuration. What we then have on the price side is when those single sided got introduced, they took this curve of driving down costs. They had, you know, everything in as an advantage. They had shipping costs were lower. Um, cost of acquiring hardware to mount it on was lower. The electronics package was simpler. There's less wiring compared to spiders. So they drove down in price. The dual sided and total power stuff kind of still around the one, one and a half thousand dollar mark. And, you know, kind of however you slice it, it's just like, oh, it includes a crank, so, you know, take off four or five hundred dollars for that. But we saw a lot of this Kickstarter stuff starting to happen with not realistic pricing. We, you know, and then they, someone would launch and it would fail. And then maybe someone would launch a real one. And then someone would launch another bogus one. So realistically, price for single side, it's still floating around the $500 to $1,000 mark. But there's a lot of Kickstarter BS out there. But there is a lot of Chinese clones starting to happen now that are, are really the driving down force of this. And the problems that some of these companies have solved, they just don't care about. You know, it's the argument of consistency is fine. Well, if you have a smart trainer or you have two bikes with power meters, any of those people will tell you it's not cutting it anymore. And in terms of accuracy, and, and this is, it really leads into this, is that 
if I get on one bike versus I get on another bike, will these two things read the same? Can I swap bikes for training? Can I swap anything? Do I have to constantly move pedals back and forth and fight with installation and stuff? Um, realistically, back in 2013, people would claim 2%, but it was in ideal circumstances. And what I mean by ideal is you zeroed everything. It was, the temperature was very consistent. You, you know, you, it had gotten to temperature. If you would change temperature, if you went up a big hill and it got colder, you adjust it, um, your, your zero point by, I hate to say it, but it's hitting the calibrate button, which is not calibrating. Um, so, you know, in this region, but things got better, things like, you know, Quark's Omnical made it so that you could change chain rings and they were more resistance to, you know, ch differential chain ring wearing or slippage of the chain rings. Um, actual real problems that, you know, when these things aged a little, they started coming out and they did a lot to really address those things. And we get into this period of, you know, some have active, some don't, uh, some have auto zeroing techniques that are really functional. So they're actually getting in and around to 2% error. And for the most part, we've started to see companies drive that down a half a percent here, or 1% there. Um, and sometimes people call them out because they're not real. Sometimes they're indiscernible. When you have your reference tool is saying one and a half percent and this company is claiming 1% and they kind of line up who's wrong, who's right. That's kind of driven down. But the single side is a bit more bogus because there's two par parts of a problem here because the first part was um, things like I've talked about in my other videos, asymmetry in their arms, and they can affect things. And some people will notice, some people won't notice, but realistically the vast majority of people can't notice because they don't have two other power meters to check it against. One power meter isn't even sufficient to check in it uh, against because maybe that one's wrong. You, you need kind of this two out of three to figure it out. But left and right balance constantly changes for some people. Like me, it's all over the place. And it generally makes it look more noisy when you're changing power outputs. So realistically, we're back kind of up at like four, six, eight percent for some people. Like I know a lot of the single-sided stuff off the shelf, not, you know, hand-checked. Um, that stuff was reading eight percent low for me. But then we get into Shimano and Shimano redesigns their cranks and some companies have some success in figuring out new techniques of adding multiple gauges and compensating for them. Um, anyone who knows my background, that's pretty much it. But after, after I've kind of left that behind, they really changed their crank design and it, it's made it terrible. There's lots of, you know, your, uh, review data out there that is saying, hey, I can't get this thing to work, especially the right side. The left side, yeah, it's kind of okay. Um, but the right sides, there's a lot of problems. And maybe they'll re redesign it, but they've gone a whole three year design cycle without really sorting out that problem. So, what's really interesting here is that we've seen stagnation on price, stagnation on features, and coming to stagnation or worse on accuracy. The market trend is showing that it's a mass market product now and it means it's going to be harder to innovate and whether or not high speed data is enough to kind of tear the market, it's hard to know. Um, we've already seen issues with the single-sided power meters, the inaccuracy. We've seen um, inaccuracy with dual-sided power meters, and we have, we've kind of seen this feature stagnation on both of those, but especially like the total power stuff, uh, it's feature stagnation to the point where they're grabbing left and right metrics and just trying to make them up as they go along. So I would love to see high-speed data, things that was demoed back here, make it here. And some of that entry-level hardware, some of that current generation things where they 
everything was just cost optimization, um, you know, they, they won't be able to do this well. And the possibility is that they're going to enter into that market and damage the viability with poor data. Because as they cheap out, you know, the individual sample on old gen might have been 2%, and on average, it's better than 2%, but all the other errors combined, still in the 2% range. But with driving that price down, that individual sample on a rotation, that one, you know, 1%, 1 so three degrees where it's sampled or ind individually sampled points, they may have such high errors, 8, 10, 15%, that yes, when they average them all out, they can get away with it and claiming they're marketing 2%. It means that those systems could just generate a lot of noise in high speed. So this price pressure may actually destroy the potential of a major change. Um, a, a, a 10X or a 100X in recording speed would likely enable all sorts of different research. All the metrics that Rotor came up with, the torque effectiveness and the pedal smoothness, the cycling dynamics that Garmin came up, that can all be generated from high-speed data. You don't need to then write a standard. You just write one standard and all that processing can happen after, can happen offline. It's a little bit of information overload on a device anyway, but it would open things to way better athletics research, understanding how people's legs um, create pedal strokes, classifying them, testing based off those classifications of training techniques. We're not just being like, well, left and right is is useless because we did a test well sort of you know if someone had perfectly balanced downstrokes on their legs and unbalanced upstrokes it looks like an unbalanced so if you then train for or er, to create an imbalanced downstroke a stronger stroke on, on one leg then you've actually been detrimental potentially so there's all sorts of this weak evidence that gets really clear when we start adding a better feature set and we have that technology now but it's hard with standards to do that you have to get everyone together and push and it's it took years for cycling dynamics to be released i remember partially reverse engineering it um back i don't know 2015 2016 i had most of it reverse engineered um and it's not hard to do this but it's What's happening in the market now may make that very difficult. Maybe, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's a good thing that, that the ultra high end may have um, a reason to be ultra high end in the future. Maybe there, there is an evolution of the ultra high end brands um, and the most reliable brands to create, you know, the elite level meter um, and not not to say that, you know, that's where we have to go in a technological way, but it's just one of those things that they kept hitting walls. I mean, this wall has existed at the beginning of Ant Plus. This wall existed two or three revisions into it. And this new wall is such a minor blip. Yeah. So hopefully you understand a little bit more of how I view the market and where it's come from. And hopefully we get to see some cool stuff happening. Um, you know, if not, we can always look forward to uh, just generalized price pressure um, that these things are just a standard feature set. Uh, other than that, we might see some separation in these markets.